Hey everyone and welcome back to Zero Escape 999 where last time we made it to the point where doors 4 and 5 converge in their routes. We searched for the missing red parts and found nothing. We searched for Santa, or sorry, we searched for Snake. They both start with an S, so they're the same person in my mind, I guess. We searched for Snake again after he went missing, and again, could not find him. So, regardless of our choice with the first door, it seems Snake will always go missing, presumably behind door three. Now, today, we are going to be picking the door that will lead us to the ending we want. Just as we picked door 4 before, and picked specific options in the previous escape rooms for that purpose, we will be, part uh, we will be picking a particular door. And that door, do not skip this episode because it will be different, is door 7. There will be different events happening because we are on the quote, correct route. I... I think I'm gonna go with door 7. Okay, 7 it is. Yeah. Alright then, that means June's gotta go through 8. What? Why? What? We've already talked about this, Junpei, though you wouldn't remember it. Santa grimaced and muttered angrily to himself, but finally began to explain. If the six of us are gonna keep going without leaving anyone behind, there's only three ways we can do it. Plan A, go through 7 with 358 and go through 8 with 467. Plan B, go through 7 with 457 and go through 8 with 368. Plan C, go through 7 with 367 and go through 8 with 458. And that's it! Those are our only options. In other words, 3 and 4 and 7 and 8 can never go through the same doors. You get it now? As Santa finished, June looked over at Junpei, tears welling up at the corners of her eyes. Oh no! You're saying we aren't going to see each other again for a long time. Junpei felt just as June did. He wanted to be at her side through whatever trials they were preparing to face. But he knew if, he were, if they were to survive, he had to swallow his feelings. In order for the six of them to move forward, he and June had to be separated. He looked at June. He was scared to lose her, but he swallowed, sealed his resolve, and did his best to smile. Hey, come on, you're making it sound like we're never going to see each other again. We gotta split up, but only for a while. This is just like we went into the four and five doors, remember? We gotta split up then too, but we all met back up. I'll bet seven and eight are just like that. You mean they're connected somewhere? Yeah, probably. Probably? She didn't sound very hopeful. It was seven that interjected. I'm sure they're going to connect somewhere. Why? What makes you think so? If they don't connect... Neither team can get through door 9. In other words, the game would end right here. Zero's been on top of his shit so far. I don't think he'd blow it now. I'm damn sure that son of a bitch wants to have his fun as long as possible. He's not gonna end this game until we get through the 9 door. June said nothing. The tears were gone, but her eyes were still sad as they looked at Junpei. He met them and, with what reassurance he could manage, laid his hand gently on her shoulder. Everything's gonna be fine. We're gonna see each other again. I promise. June bit her lip and gave him an almost imperceptible nod. Yes, promise? Her voice was barely above a whisper. Santa's voice shattered the moment. Ah, you guys are done, right? He stretched and continued. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Clover and I will both go in separate groups. I figure I'll take eight and Clover can take seven. Any problem with that, Clover? Clover looked away and was silent for a moment. Whatever. It was more a dismissal than an agreement, but Santa didn't seem to care. Alright, we're ready to go then. Let's move. At Santa's command, the group split and headed for their respective doors. Clover, Seven, and Junpei walked toward door 7. Santa, Lotus, and June headed for door 8. For a long moment, they stood in front of the door. Seven took a deep breath. You guys ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's go. The door had opened. A narrow hallway stretched out before them. Seven and Clover leapt through the door. The moment they did, their bracelets beeped. The detonators in the bracelets had been activated. 
Junpei stepped forward to follow them. But as he was about to step over the threshold, he stopped. He looked to his right, toward door 8. June stood there, a mirror image of Junpei. She turned and looked toward him. Their eyes met. They nodded. Their farewell took almost one and a half seconds. Then someone took hold of Junpei's arms and hauled him bodily through the door. He heard the sound of the numbered door slam shut behind him. His bracelet gave a cold electronic beep. Only 81 seconds left. No time to waste, guys. Let's get moving. Seven led the way down the hallway. Junpei and Clover followed him as fast as they could. After what seemed like far more than 81 seconds, they reached the end of the hall. To the left of a wooden door, they found the dead. There was no time to rest or catch their breath. All three slammed their hands in quick succession over the scanner panel on the dead. <sighs> Still trying to catch his breath, Seven leaned heavily against the wall. It stopped. It stopped. <laughs> his, file, uh, his smile seemed forced and a little crooked. This is the second time we've gone through one of these numbered doors, but... <sighs> you never really get used to it. He stood up straight, no longer out of breath, and wiped some of the sweat from his head and neck. Clover smirked at him. I would have thought a guy your size would have bigger balls than that. Let's not do this again, you two. What? What the hell did you just say? They say it again, I dare you. You. Have. No. You little. You wanna die? I'd like to see you try. You fucking brat. Alright, let's go. Hey, hey, calm down, guys. This isn't the time for a this. It's not gonna do us any good. Hmm. Uh. Gosh. Junpei sighed. Sometimes he wondered if the doors and the puzzles they were really the greatest challenge they faced. Wait here for a minute, alright? I'm gonna go see if there are any other doors. They didn't respond, but Junpei wasn't in the mood for a conversation anyway. Of course they're gonna do this shit again. Oh, these idiots, stop fighting! First he examined the inner part of the numbered door. It was, of course, shut tight. On the left was a single short hallway that terminated almost immediately at a thick iron wall. Junpei doubted the wall could be moved. At last he gave up and returned to Seven, who was tapping lightly on the wooden door. This door is the only option we've got, right? Yeah, it looks like it. There was a metal plaque bolted above the door. A red operating room. If it was to be believed, the room on the other side of the door was an operating room. Something about it made Junpei feel nervous. Well, there's no point to standing around. Might as well go in and see what's waiting for us. Seven grabbed the brass knob and slowly opened the door. The creak of the hinge sounded like the groan of an old woman. A chill snaked its way down Junpei's spine. Quickly, he gathered what courage he could and took the first step into the room. Seven followed with Clover right behind him. Part of the room just past the door was obscured by a screen. Clover's curiosity got the better of her and she darted past Junpei to peer around the screen. Clover, no, don't. It's, it's just mannequins. Don't worry about it. Eee! Her scream nearly blew out Junpei's eardrums. He and Seven ran toward Clover to see what had frightened her. They ran to the screen, and the cause of her outburst was immediately clear. What the hell is this? Is this a corpse? It was something that looked kind of like a human lying across some sort of bed. No, not a bed. An operating table. The table sat on a rusty steel lift, uh, and a cluster of bright operating lights shone down on it from the ceiling. Slowly they approached. As they got closer to the body, it became clear that it wasn't a body at all. What the hell? That's just a huge doll or something. A doll? Clover did not look terribly comforted. Slowly, she approached the operating table and looked as intently as possible from as far away as possible at the thing. <sighs> Junpei could see her relax. You're right. It's only a doll. Man, it really scared me. She heaved a great sigh of relief and wiped a few drops of sweat from her forehead. Seven smirked. Heh. <laughs> well, I guess it would have been weird if you actually had any balls. Seven! God! Not this again! Shut it! 
Don't you start with me, fatty. Oh my god, you too. Oh, what's this? You want a piece of me, short stuff? Yeah, bring it on, you whale. Hey, guys, not again, okay? Seriously, knock it off. Hmm. Hmm. Junpei sighed and shook his head. Anyway, it looks like he's got something the two of you could stand to have a little more of. I'm talking about a heart. Huh? Oh, this? You mean on his chest? Yeah. It was set a little higher than normal for a human body, but from the shape of the organ, it, there could be no doubt that it was a heart. Why would there be a heart in a doll? I don't think it's a doll. You think maybe it's like a medical mannequin or something? Or maybe it's got more personal uses. Okay, now you can kill him, Clover. Simmons' grin was more than a little perverted. Clover glared at him. Anyway, how about we take a look around this place? Let's go. Okay. Sure thing. So we know what to do here. We have solved this puzzle before. So we should be able to get through fairly easily. Then let's get started. So starting out, I believe we want to take a look at this table for the forceps. Then we gotta go get the body piece over here. We're just gonna go through this as quickly as possible. Is there anything on... Okay, it was not on there. Got it. I thought I saw something on the left side of the table. Uh, next up, this table has the scalpel. And then this body we can cut into with the scalpel. Ew, gross! Hey Junpei, there's a slit in this thing's chest. Yeah, sure is. There's... There's something in there. Maybe we can get it out. Ugh. Damn it. This thing and thing won't budge. Right, we need the forceps for that. It's stuck. Well, I guess you can't force, uh, force, use force on this one then. We need something small that can fit into that little hole. Yep, yep, fair enough. Got the forceps. Got the fake organ. Now we cut it open. Let's try cutting this organ with a scalpel and we get the key. Okay, I believe that is everything in this room. So now we can move directly on to over here where we've got, oh, we got to do this last. I remember that now. So we're doing over here first into the chemical room. All right, first off we have blue liquid, red liquid, the code. One, two, three, carbon dioxide is three, ammonia is four, ethanol is, oh god, what was ethanol? I'll need to go recount. What do you think this is a hint for? Maybe it's got something to do with this box? Indeed it does. Let's see, where's the ethanol? Hmm? Something stinks. Is it coming from this bottle? It says NH3, okay, ammonia. That's not what we want. Then we'll skip through there. Oh, good stuff. Let's go for a drink. What are you talking about? I'm talking about that bottle. It says C2H5OH, right? Okay, C2H5OH. Two, seven, eight, nine. Three, four, nine's the password. Got it. Thank you, seven. Now let's open the box and get what's inside. Oh, it is nice knowing the solutions to these puzzles so we can just go right on through and see what's new. Speaking of, we're about to get what's new. Got a fake heart, got a fake right arm, and that's everything in there, so let's get out of here. You think we should go back? Yeah, I think that's probably best. Clover nodded and left. Junpei was about to follow her when he realized that Seven wasn't following suit. Hey Seven, what's up? Oh, well. He looked up at Junpei distractedly, then back down at the brown bottle he, had, he held cupped in his large hands. What's that? In response, Seven tossed the bottle gently to Junpei. He caught it and twisted it around to read the label. Eth ethylene diamine tartrate? EDT, it's tartaric ethylene diamine. What kind of medicine is that? It's not medicine, I think it's an industrial strength detergent. Why would they have something like, something like that here? Well, probably to clean stuff up. Clean what up? Junpei, it's an operating room. Fuck if I know. Still, it looks like it's cleaned my brain up. Junpei looked up from the bottle. You remember something? 
Seven nodded slowly and spoke. Well, I remember a story about EDT. It happened about 50 years ago. There was this factory somewhere in America making big old EDT, uh, EDT crystals. They are making it to sell as an industrial strength cleaner like I told you before. But... A year after the factory started up, something strange started happening with the crystals they were building. Water molecules started attaching themselves to the EDT crystals. This made them into a sort of mutation of the original crystals called a hydrate. Once the crystal turns into a hydrate though, it's useless as a cleaner. The factory had to just dump the crystals. As a hydrate, they were useless. But it didn't end there. After that day, the same thing started happening in EDT factories everywhere. Even ones nowhere near that first American factory. They'd been making crystals the same way with the same materials and the same equipment and environment. But now, all of a sudden, every single crystal they formed turned into a hydrate. In fact, ever since that day, no factory anywhere has been able to make a pure EDT crystal. Does this sound familiar? Even in EDT research done years before, they'd never gotten a hydrate. But after it happened at the first factory, it just spread. It was like, man, how do you say it? Like the molecules were communicating with one another, transmitting information in a way humans couldn't perceive. This phenomenon spread throughout the world, right? Junpei, uh, Junpei looked up at Seven with half a smirk. Seven stared at him, uh, dumbfounded. Yeah, that's, that's it exactly. But how did you know? I heard another story kind of like that one. When? In the freezer. What? The freezer? Junpei told Seven the story he'd heard from June in the freezer in the kitchen. How one day, glycerin began to crystallize, and the story of ice that wouldn't melt at room temperature. When Junpei was done, Seven looked thoughtful and absentmindedly rubbed the scar on his chin. Ice that doesn't melt at room temperature, huh? That sound familiar? Yeah, hold up, I feel like I can remember something. It's, it's right there. Seven squinted. His eyes stared off into space as if he were trying desperately to focus on something far away. Do you... know about Ice-9? Do you know about Ice-9? Ice-9. 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 Ice, ice, ice. Suddenly, Seven's eyes shot open. That's it. I remember now. That woman, she's on this boat. That woman? I'm sorry? Alice. Alice. Who's Alice? Come on, the woman who will melt at room temperature. Are all the pieces starting to come together? And the reason I did the routes in this order starting to make sense. Are you starting to notice how everything is starting to connect? Remember all ice. Come on, the woman who won't melt at room temperature. Huh? It became clear to Seven that Junpei had no idea what he was talking about. He ran his hand across his face and took a deep breath. You know how the Titanic sank on April 15th, 1912, right? Yeah, more than 1,500 people died. Worst maritime accident in history. What about it? Did you hear about the boat that was sent to collect the dead bodies? I think that was the RMS Carpathia, right? It was a cruise liner, just like the Titanic. No, that was the ship that picked up the survivors. The ship that collected the dead bodies was the CS McKay Bennett. The McKay Bennett showed up on April 17th, two days after the accident. It set out from Halifax of Port in Canada, and recovered 306 bodies. The Atlantic, that far north, was really cold. It would have to be for there to be icebergs and stuff. Anyway, the bodies they pulled out of the water were frozen solid. This isn't a very nice story. So what happened next? Well, they, uh, they say the McKay Bennett recovered something more than just dead bodies. There were various bits of stuff floating around in the water. Things the drowned had carried around with them or stuff dislodged from as the ship sank. One of the things they found was a coffin. A coffin? Yeah, a wooden one. The craftsman who made it must have been pr pretty skilled. It wasn't just a wooden coffin, it was all wood. There were no nails or reinforcements and there were no gaps in the wood anywhere. It was airtight. The crew got pretty curious about what might be inside of it and opened it up. They had to get a wedge and hammer it open, it was so well made. Inside, they found a woman, or I guess you should say, they found the bo a dead body of a woman. Her hair was thick and black and her skin was deep brown and didn't show any signs of age or decomposition. 
They say that she looked gorgeous, like a goddess. She was obviously dead, but everyone who looked at her said she looked uh, she just looked like she was sleeping. Her skin was so lifelike, she looked like she might wake up at any minute. She didn't, though. Like the rest of the bodies they found, she was frozen solid. Eventually, the McCabe Bennett finished the search and returned to the Halifax. The 306 bodies were unloaded and taken ashore. However, it was warm enough that they began to melt. They say that the sink was horrible. But there was one body that didn't thaw. The girl in the coffin. That's right. Everybody thought for sure that she'd melt and start to rot with it like the rest of them eventually. But weeks passed and nothing happened. Then a month had passed and another and it was summer and she was still frozen solid. After a while, people started to say she was some sort of miracle. Rumors about the girl started to spread and people came to visit Halifax from all over. After a while, people started to call her All Ice. Alice. Of course, those rumors didn't last long. Why? Well, she up and disappeared. One day Alice was there and the next day she wasn't. They say someone snuck into where they were keeping her and stole the body. With the body gone, the rumors followed pretty quickly. And after a while, no one remembered her. You might be able to find something about her if you could find a newspaper from back then, but that's about it. Wait, you just said that she was on this boat. Yeah, I did. Alice has got to be somewhere on this ship. How can you- Now why the hell would you say something like that? Because I know. And just what is it you know? What happened to Alice after she was stolen? How do you know this? Seven? Junpei gulped. Alright, tell me. What happened to Alice? Seven nodded slowly and took, uh, took on the look of a man recalling something long buried. Well, around that time, the, wor the word was there was a thriving black market in New York. I mean, I'm sure there still is, but this was special. All millionaires from all over the world. I've heard that Alice went up for auction there. You've heard this, but you don't know this. The person who won the auction was Lord Dashiell Gordain. You've heard that name before, right? Sir Gordain? Isn't he the guy who bought the Gigantic, the Titanic sister ship? Yeah, that's him. Although I guess he hadn't done that yet. What do you mean? Gordain bought Alice in 1912. Then four years later in 1916, he bought the Gigantic. And he hid Alice somewhere on the Gigantic. But nobody knows where. He died in 1931. And apparently he, did, he died without ever telling anyone where Alice was hidden. However... However, what? Well, he did have one close friend who asked him, Where is Alice? And he said, Alice sleeps in a small chamber past the forest of knowledge, beneath the navel of the Gigantic. What the hell is that? Some kind of riddle? Your guess is as good as mine. Seven threw his hands up in defeat. So that's it. Whatever you think, I believe it. She's hidden somewhere on the Gigantic. In other words, she's hidden somewhere on this ship. Because you believe this is a Gigantic. Hmm. Before Junpei could dispute Seven's rather bizarre claim, they heard Clover's voice from the door. She did not sound pleased. Hey! What are you two doing over there? Stop wasting time and get over here! Okay, okay, we're coming. Ah! Seven looked at Junpei. Yeah, so anyway, that's the story. It might be useful someday. Don't forget it. With that cryptic remark, he turned and left the room. Junpei was left behind to ponder what he'd just heard. He tried to remember what June had told him earlier. That mummy wasn't just a normal mummy. They say that she was frozen. The story says that from the time of his discovery all the way through to when it got put on the Titanic, and even though it was carried through the desert, her body never melted. Was that Egyptian priestess Alice? Had the water in her body become Ice Nine? And with these stories of... Changes in chemicals spreading. Hmm. No, that's nuts. There's no way somebody like that could exist. But we've got multiple people telling the same story. Junpei shook his head, trying desperately to clear it, and followed Seven to the operating room where Clover was waiting. Okay. Now then, we're done in that room. Let's go put those liquids into the jar and finish this up. So, I was mistaken the first time we came through here. Um... Hey, it turned red! Forget about that, didn't you hear that just now? 
Uh, we can put the red liquid in and then the blue liquid in, but let's put in the blue liquid next. I'll put the red liquid back in the bottle. Okay, I was wrong. Junpei isn't magic. He's not able to unmix the liquids. Hey, the blue light turned on. And I heard a noise. It sounded like something unlocking. And finally, the red liquid. I get it. You combine the red liquid and the blue liquid to make a purple one. The purple light turned on. Right when I did, uh, right when I did, I heard a noise. What do you think it was? That noise came from somewhere close by. Something in this room must have changed. All right, let's go take a look. All right. Liquid's dealt with. Let's get everything out of the closet. We got a leg. We got a leg. And we got a torso. Hooray. Beautiful. Now let's go fix up Lucy's body. So I believe it was that we needed to examine her head. Okay, so we've collected the six parts of the medical mannequin. So you think these uh, parts here go to this... Um... Oh, you mean Lucy. That's her name, I think. You see, it says Lucy right here. Oh yeah, right. That table over there says John. Hmm. Well, it doesn't look like John is missing any of his parts. So the ones we've got must be for Lucy, right? Yeah. Seems like it. Well, I say let's give Lucy her parts back. Any objections? Nope. Agreed. All right, let's get started. Combine! Now we just switch everything except for... Hey, nothing happened. That's odd. Maybe it's... Uh, maybe it's the wrong weight? Wait? Yeah, well, you know how there's a scale on the side of the bed? Maybe we need to get the scale to a specific number. How are we gonna do that? I think we're supposed to swap her body parts with John's. Oh, let's give it a shot. Where were the... Where was the file? I forget where the file was that actually tells us uh, the body weight. The parts... The weights of the body parts. But, as before, switch everything except for the head and the heart. Hey Junpei, I just heard something. It came from John's operating table. We better check it out. Alright, let's go check on John. Huh? The lid on the scale. We got a key. Hey, it opened! Oh, I get it. It must have opened because we matched John's weight to what's on the chart. When did we pick up the... Did we pick up the chart at some point? No, we didn't. We didn't. Jinpei, I think I broke you. Alright, so. As we saw when we were talking with Seven earlier. On the correct route through the game, we're going to be getting far more lengthy conversations in various locations. We have one more in this escape room before we're done here. So if you've tuned out yet, uh, if you've tuned out already, I'm sorry. Uh, if you have not tuned out yet, well, we've got something important coming up. But first, let's unlock the door. Hey, hold on. Junpei stopped about to put the key into the doorknob. What's up? Where's Clover? Huh? Junpei turned around. Clover was nowhere to be seen. God damn it, where the hell did she go? Okay, just hold on a moment, I'll go get her. Sure thing. Junpei like, uh, left Seven at the door and headed back to the operating room. He found her standing next to the operating table. She was staring at the mannequin. Hey Clover, what's wrong? Come on, let's get out of here. She didn't respond. If she hadn't been standing up and breathing, Junpei might have thought she was dead. What are you doing? Did you want to come back here and say goodbye to John? It wasn't the best joke, but it was something. An attempt to lighten the mood. Clover didn't laugh. She stood stock still and said nothing. Hey Clover, can you hear me? Perhaps it was something he'd said, or perhaps it was something else. Suddenly her mouth opened and she whispered in a dry, dead voice. My brother might be dead. Huh? That's why we couldn't find him. If he's dead, I'm gonna be next. Suddenly the operating room felt very, very cold. What are you talking about? What's wrong with you? He gave her a small shake, but she still, she still didn't respond. The silence grew heavier. Junpei has a choice. Give her the four-leaf clover we got from Santa. 
Oh yeah! He didn't know why, but suddenly Junpei remembered something he'd been given earlier. He reached into his pocket and dug it out. A four-leaf clover. Santa had given it to him in the second-class room. He held it out to Clover. Did you know that each leaf on the four-leaf clover means something? Hope, faith, love, and luck. Take it. Use it as a good luck charm. He pressed the four-leaf clover into her hand. Listen to me, Clover. No matter what happens, you can never lose hope. You have to remember what's most important, and that's to have faith and to have love. If you can remember all of those, that'll bring you good luck. Snake. I mean, your brother, he's not dead. He's alive somewhere, I'm sure of it. You've just got to believe in that. Clover stared at the four-leaf clover in her hand. He could see tears start to form at the corners of her eyes. Thank you. Her voice was tiny and broken, and as she spoke, she started to cry. She tried to hide, uh, to hide her tears by looking at the floor, but it did little good. She wiped away tears with the baggy arms of her jacket, but more quickly took their pla uh, more quickly took their place. No matter how she tried, she couldn't stop crying. Her tears made small, wet circles on the floor. Thank you, she said it again. Then she looked up at Junpei and seemed to choke down the last of her grief. She did her best to smile. Junpei wiped an errant tear from her, uh, from her cheek with his thumb and gave her the best smile he could manage. Now come on, someone's waiting for us at the exit. But still she didn't move. Wait, before we go, there's one thing I want to ask you. What's that? What do you think when you hear the word experiment? For a moment, his mind froze. Then he came back to his senses and realized the word meant nothing to him, aside from the dictionary definition. Uh, what? Oh, huh. I guess it was just a coincidence then. I mean, that you knew about the four-leaf clover. Uh, look, I'm sorry, I don't want to be a jerk, but you're making less than no sense right now. Oh, no, 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 it's nothing. Just forget about it. Oh, don't give me that! You really think I could just drop this? What is this experiment you are talking about? Clover looked away. The four-leaf clover was still in her hand. Then she stared at it for a long moment and then finally spoke. You promise you won't tell anyone? Cross my heart. Really? Really. I promise, Clover. Whatever you have to tell us, we will not tell anyone. I can trust you, right? Of course you can. At least I like to think you can. Clover slipped the four-leaf clover into her pocket. Her eyes still red from crying, she looked up at Junpei. Okay then, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what happened on this ship nine years ago. Are you ready? Wait, 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 wait. On this ship? Yeah, this ship. He was entirely lost. He had a thousand questions, but it was probably best, he thought, to save them until Clover had finished. It was an experiment to test some sort of psychic thing. Something about communicating through these fields that you can't see. Fields that you can't see. He'd heard something like this before. Clover nodded. Like, think about this. She pointed at the operating table. On top of it was a somewhat mismatched medical mannequin whose parts had been swapped with another mannequin. This is John, right? But is he really John? All Junpei could think was, she has finally completely lost it. Isn't this like Lock Socks? Or the ship of Theseus? Junpei grew even more confused. He never heard of either of those things, although they sounded smart. You don't know? You haven't heard of these paradoxes? Junpei shook his head. Clover laughed. Okay, well, pay attention then. This is how Lock Socks works. Let's say I've got a pair of socks, and they're my favorite socks. One of them gets a hole in it. What would you do if that was your sock, Junpei? I would patch it up, if it was my favorite sock. Also, I don't like wasting things, so... Well, I'd patch it up, I guess. Get some cloth and close up the hole. But what if another hole opens? I'd have a, add another patch, I suppose. What if another hole opened after that? Um, another patch, I guess. Well, let's say you just keep adding new patches. Until eventually, the original cloth of the sock is totally gone. Once you get to that point, can you really say they're the same socks you started with? Hmm, that's, uh, that's tough. Junpei crossed his arms. So, that's the lock socks thing. Yeah, 
The ship of Theseus is a lot like it. The ship of Theseus. If you keep fixing the damaged parts of a ship, eventually it ends up with none of the parts it started with. Can you really say that ship is the ship of Theseus that you started with? And what if you took all the old parts from the first ship and built another one somewhere else? Then which ship is the real ship of Theseus? The one you repaired? Or the one you built with all the original parts? There's another paradox similar to this. Um, it's not quite, it's not the same. But I, I thought of this when they brought up the building a new ship of Theseus with the original parts. Um, there's a mathematical paradox. I believe it's the Banaktarsky paradox. It is possible to divide up a sphere with certain assumptions about how you're able to break up a sphere um, where you can take one sphere and use that, break it into parts, and use those parts to make two spheres of the exact same size and shape and volume and everything as the original sphere you had. Which one's the original sphere and where did the extra matter come from? It's not quite the same, you can tell, but it, you can also see how I made that connection. Hmm, it was an interesting question. Clover could see Junpei was intrigued. Hey, do you think it's the same? What's the same? These guys. Is this John? Or is it Lucy now? Junpei looked at the operating table again. A mannequin full of body parts from a different body. Clover had been right. It was just like Lock Socks and the ship of Theseus. The part of the body that holds a person's identity is the head. Of course, for many hundreds of years, conventional wisdom had held that a man's identity resided in his heart, or any of a number of inter internal organs. John's head and heart were both his. But apart from that, in a single arm, the rest of his body had once been Lucy's. Was that mannequin really John? We're just like these mannequins. She looks at Junpei again. Think about it. The cells in our body change every day. The old ones die and new ones are born. I think every cell in your body is replaced roughly every seven years? Like, not all at once, obviously, but... Your body's uh, continuously replacing cells to the point like every seven years or so, every single cell in your body is brand new. I think it's seven years. I could be wrong on that, on that number. Maybe part of my arm is made of stuff from a fish I ate once. Or maybe part of your right side is made from a cow you ate. If you take it all a little further, those cows and fishes are made from something else too, right? That's how we're all connected through fields that can't be seen with a naked eye. The silence is broken by Seven. Hey, what the hell is taking you two so long? Okay, Seven, we did this earlier, and Clover got mad. Uh, could you give us our turn, me and Clover, to have our weirdly long conversation about philosophy? Seven's head appeared on the doorway. He was not happy. How long are you going to make me wait? We don't have time to screw around. Junpei and Clover looked at each other. Clover looked at Junpei as if to say there was more she wanted to tell him. She shook her head. Whatever she had to tell him, she didn't want to tell him in front of Seven. Seven seemed to catch on. Oh, what were you two doing? Was this some sort of secret meeting? No, it wasn't. We were just... Just? Playing with the mannequins. Clover, no, please, 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 please don't say that in front of Seven. Huh? Let's go, let's go, Junpei. Moving a little bit too fast to be entirely innocent, Clover headed toward the exit. She got really skittish in front of Seven. Huh. Seven stared after her, then turned to Junpei with an amused expression. Playing with mannequins, huh? Didn't know you were into that kind of thing, Junpei. She didn't get a chance to tell us about what happened on the ship nine years ago. You're a dick. Junpei dashed past him and traced Clover's path out the door. With a short laugh, Seven followed. They stood looking out the door. Junpei took out the Jupiter key. Alright, I'm gonna open it now, is that cool? You don't need to keep asking. Just do it, alright? <laughs> fine then. He slid the key into the keyhole and turned it. He felt an unlock. The door opened with a soft, melancholy creak. Beyond it lay a simple, white hallway. There was no fanfare or confetti. Obviously, there was no one there to applaud them. They simply walked through the door. That was it. Alright, let's get going. Hey man, what's up with you? You're so serious, you know? 
Can't you sound more happy? You know, get a little excited. Not really. Junpei turned away from Seven and took his first step down the simple white hallway. My brother might be dead. I'm gonna be next. Clover had told him only a few minutes before that her brother was probably dead and she was likely to follow him. How could he pretend to be happy after hearing something like that? I'll see everyone next time.